Welcome to the third part of our sermon series, Generosity. Two of the greatest inhibitors of our blessings are envy and discontentment. Join Pastor Tony as he discusses how we can avoid these dangerous pitfalls as we pursue a closer walk with Christ. Enjoy the message. We are on a series entitled Generosity, Three Ways to Kill Your Blessing. If you've missed any of these or you'd like to see them in their entirety, they're on YouTube. You can find them at the, at the website, rockfishchurch.com, or you can watch them on the app as well. We also have CDs available. If I don't finish or get through this, um, the entirety of the message is on the CDs, and those are free. You can pick them up in the foyer at one of the welcome centers. But this is part three of the series, Generosity, Three Ways to Kill Your Blessing. One, something that we all know, is God is good. God is a giving God. His love, his nature, his character by design compels him to give. Like the video said, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without being compelled to give. And it says God was, God so was, was so compelled by love that he gave his only begotten son. God so loved. God was so compelled by love that he gave. That's a natural response. When you love somebody, when you fall into somebody, you want to lavish over them your presence or the gifts or whatever. You remember, ladies, when you dated, you got flowers. You got married. <laughs> Suckers. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and guys, you remember how they would go anywhere with you? They would go shooting or riding your motorcycle. Dating is such a deception. Now I would have to shoot my wife to get her on the back of a motorcycle. Anyway, God is good, but he's giving. And generosity, I believe, is truly a defining characteristic of our God. So that leaves us with a very profound question. In fact, if we don't answer this question, I, I, I think that the series becomes moot. And here's the question. Can I really shut down the generosity of God in my life? Can I frustrate the flow of of God's blessing in my life. You see, this is important because in our culture, guess what? We have abdicated responsibility for everything. We can blame it on our mama or our daddy or our lack of mama or our lack of daddy. We can blame it on our wife or our husband or our lack of wife and husband. We can blame it on our finances or lack of finances. We can blame it on anything, and that's what we've been taught in our culture, that nothing is our personal responsibility, and I think we need to repent. So that... That leaves the question, can I frustrate the blessings of God? God is big. God is huge and powerful. Can little old you mess up his best for you? Good question. Today we're going to be looking at what I call the deadly duo of envy and discontentment. Now these two go together. They have one root. I'm going to discuss that root at the very end of this message. But the idea is, I deserve better. Why is it that this guy got the promotion? Why is it that I didn't get the promotion? I work harder. I'm better qualified. But I got some bad news for you. Guess where promotion comes from? Ooh. The Bible says that promotion comes from God. I don't like it. God's not fair. I'm a harder worker. I'm better qualified. Why is this rascal getting this job? God, this is messed up. But promotion comes from the Lord. His ways are not our ways. Maybe that guy needs to be in that position to learn something from you, or maybe you need to learn something from God. I'm not even going to get into all of that today, but when we get into envy and we get into discontentment, we get into a very dangerous place. Let me just show you how dangerous. Listen to this in James 3.16. It says, For where you have envy and selfish ambition. That's what discontentment is. Selfish ambition. Dog eat dog world. I'm going to get mine. i got to get the best end of that stick. Whatever that deal is. Personally, let me just throw this out there. If you do a deal with me, I don't have to get the best end of the deal. My wife hates this. I shouldn't say that. This makes things very difficult sometimes. But I don't have to get the best end of the deal. Look, I, I don't want to rip you off. I want everybody to have a good deal. It's just the way I'm made. You know what? I'm, I, I know I'm never going to get rich off one transaction, you see. But I want you to feel and walk away from that deal feeling like feeling good about what you did. I, I was a terrible car dealer. I'm just going to tell you. Hey, man, this is a great car, but you know, it squeaks and it does some other stuff. 
I know I could probably sell it to you for this, but I'll give it. I was bad at it because of that principle. That's why I say my wife, is, she struggles with it sometimes. But For where envy and selfish ambition is, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So look at this. This shows you just how dangerous envy and selfish ambition or discontentment can be in a person's life. It says where these two are present, as innocent as they may seem in our lives, you can bet your bottom dollar or God lied that there is disorder and every evil practice. That's huge. That means that these two open a conduit for every bad thing. And Guys, before I go any further, I want you to understand something about today's message, about this installment. I'm preaching from the middle. Okay, I am imploring you to hear beyond me and do not make the mistake that I, am, I have achieved ascendancy in every area that I'm going to be talking to you about today, Okay, because this is very difficult. It is a fight that we must all be in it to win it. You understand what I'm saying? I'm preaching this from a position of struggling with these things, not standing up here going, I've, I've got the answers and their, their finality is present in my life. I'm preaching this one from the middle. But what this tells us is that Wanting to keep up with the Joneses is not as innocent as it might appear. Wanting to have something because they have it to, to, to keep that status quo, to, to keep up that appearance, is to keep, it, it, it's bad. In fact, again, it says it opens the door to disorder and every evil practice. I call it the gateway attitude of destruction. And when you have that envy and you have that, it's, it's, it's like a gateway drug. Now, back to the question that makes all of this relevant or irrelevant. Can I shut down the generosity of God in my life? Can I frustrate the flow of God in my life? May I have a little bit to do with what's going on? So you already be open and honest and transparent before God. There is a story that I believe is going to reflect this undubitably, undoubtedly. It's going to show us very clearly what this looked like. Uh, Joshua 7 and 8. Many of us are familiar with the, this, particular ver, this particular area in Scripture. You remember when, when um, Moses had died and Joshua rallied all the troops and he said, we're going into the promised land and we're going to take the first city is Jericho. And God says, I'm going to give you Jericho. Well, that's not the story. <laughs> it, it's, it precludes the story that were, or it's just before the story that I'm going to be talking about. But in the book of Joshua, when they crossed over the river, God said, I'm going to do something miraculous. We all know the story. They marched and they marched and they marched seven times and the walls fell down and something happened. God gave them an incredibly powerful victory over the city of Jericho, an incredibly fortified city that everybody looking on said, if they can take Jericho, they can take anything. This is the insurmountable opposition if they can do this, and sure enough, God gave it to them. And all the nations of the entire world over there begin to shake and tremble because they understood that their God was present with them. Their God was powerful to deliver. And if it had destroyed Jericho, it could destroy anything. With that, God set one condition. He said, listen, I'm going to give you this city. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give it over to you, and you're going to have Tremendous success, but listen to me very carefully. And this is representative of the tithe. He said, do not touch anything in this city. Do not take one red cent. Do not take any of the cattle. Do not take any of the people. Do not do, leave this city for me. It is the first fruits of what it, it's saying. God, you're going to give us all of the land, but this one is yours. It is marked for destruction. Okay. So where we're going to come in is, is right there. So the next city they come to after they defeat Jericho is a little city called Ai. Now, it's, it's interesting because Ai literally in the original language means heap of ruins. Okay? So there's this little city. Now, let me tell you what this is compared to. Let's just say that you're Joshua today. Outside is your army. Yesterday, you just totally defeated Fayetteville, North Carolina. Okay, you took it. Everybody in Fayetteville is wiped out. You just decimated Fayetteville. You turn south. You cross over into Robco. And there's Parkton. You look back and you see this great city of Fayetteville that you just annihilated with all its pomp. 
and circumstance, and you see Parkton with his busted roads and out lights, and you think, oh, we're going to whip these guys. In fact, when they come to Ai, Joshua sent two guys to go check out Ai. They come back and said, Big J, don't even send the whole army. We just need two or 3,000 people, and we will absolutely annihilate Park to, um, Ai. <laughs> well, it didn't work out quite like they thought. Okay, it looked unopposing. It looked like a heap of ruins. But how many of you have seen those 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 yellow mounds that pop up all over your yard after a heavy rain? You see, if you're not from North Carolina around here, you don't really know what I'm talking about. But go kick one of those mounds and stand. Uh huh. We call it in the South. In 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 Robco, they call them far ants. You say, what's a far ant? I'll beat the far out of you. Anyway. It, Fire ants is what they are. Anyway, we used to have a hockey team called the Fire Ants, but buddy, you kick one of those things and they pour out and they will grab onto you and bite you and they fully expect to die. I'm, I'm convinced of that because they bite you and they curl up. Next morning, you got blisters. It's bad. Well, that's what happened. These two or 3,000 guys roll up in front of the city of Park to, or the gates of Ai. <laughs> they kick open those gates and those rascals poured out on them like fire ants. Ah! They started, they started biting them. They took off running down the hill, killed 30, I think it was 36. Please read this section of scripture. It is so rich. I'm just pulling out a, a microcosm of what's in this. But they poured out on these guys and they whooped them. I mean, they didn't just whip them there. It says they chased them down the road. Can you see that picture? This mighty army that just whipped Fayetteville, it just took Jericho, is now running from this city that literally means a heap of ruins. Incredible people, right? Well, they come to Joshua. I can see him now. Hey, Big J. <laughs> they whooped us. And he's going, what? They got dead people thrown over their shoulders. 36 families have just lost their husbands or their children. Joshua immediately does something. Just, I, I noted this. He, he does something. He drops down on his face and begins to cry out to God. He begins to question everything. And listen to one of the first things he says. God, why have you forsaken us? Listen to this. Why have you broken your covenant with us? Why have you brought us here? Was it to die? God, you gave us this city, and now you want us to be a laughing stock because these little guys whip us. God, what have you done? And in the middle of his blathering, God shows up. You ever notice sometimes when you're just down having your pity party, wondering what's going on, God just shows up with a word that you don't like, but you know it's true because it came from him and you don't know what to do with it. Watch this. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up, boy. <laughs> he, he didn't say it quite like that, but I, <laughs> get up, boy. He, he said, rise up. But in, since we're in Parkton, anyway. Why, why is it that you have... See, God is perplexed. He said, why is it that you have fallen on your face? What are you doing? See, listen to this next verse, and it's going to explain God's frustration. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. See, Joshua is perplexed why this is going on. God shows up on the scene. You've got to remember, everything God does is in the context of covenant. He comes, he says, guys... Well, Joshua, what are you doing? See, we're in covenant with God. You know what that means? That means according to his, his mind, his way of doing things, that we don't sleek into the throne room to ask for prayers. You know, we don't sneak in through the back door. You understand that? We are in covenant with Almighty God, just as Joshua and the nation of Israel was in covenant with Almighty God. If it's not working, it's because something's wrong. And I can promise you, it didn't break on his part. You, you understand? God holds his part of the covenant. We apply our faith to understand that. Understand this. In this covenant that we are in now, it is a covenant of grace with the condition of faith. Do you understand? If you're going to walk in alignment with the conditions of his covenant, it means the just shall live by faith. That's what we do. We do everything we do by faith. He said, get up, man. What are you doing? He said, this went bad because you sinned. Somebody has done something. See, we have the ability because of who we are in the context of the covenant of grace that God has placed us in to come boldly before the throne of grace. 
We have the ability to walk in through the very throne room of God, heads held high, heart real humble, take hold to the horns of the altar and ask what we will, knowing full well that God said all of his promises in Christ are yes and amen. All of a sudden, Joshua is on his face going, what's wrong, God? Why have you done this? What are you doing to me? And God comes and paints a very clear picture and says, you have done some things. God continues. He said, my covenant which I have commanded you, and they have even taken some of the things under the ban and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. Listen to this. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They have turned their backs before their enemies, for they have been they have become accursed. Listen, I will not abide with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban that are in your midst. This man, these people, this person that we're going to discover, effectively killed the blessings of God. Listen, listen, listen. Not only for himself, but his behavior affected the entire nation. See, there's some of you in here who are doing stuff in your life, and you tell me it's none of my business. Pastor Tony, it's only hurting me. I know it's wrong, but what's the damage? Let me tell you what the damage is. If you are a part of the body of Christ, at very least, you are, you are robbing the body of Christ of the resource that God called you to be. At the very least, maybe God destined for you to become that man or woman of God of prayer who can intercede. Maybe I die because you don't take your part as a prayer warrior that God's called you to take. Every one of us are connected. Every joint is designed to supply. When you rob God, you are robbing the body. You understand, the person who took this didn't just affect him. 36 men, husbands and sons died because of this person's compromise. God said, you need to consecrate a fast. You need to tell these, here's what it looked like. Joshua got up and went, all right, God, I'll fix this. All right, Rockfish Church, somebody in here has done something very bad. You know who it is. I mean, y'all are in the congregation. You, you see where I'm at? You're, you're there at that moment. Who is it? Well, tomorrow, we're going to all appear here. We're going to come before God, and he is going to show us exactly who that rascal is. Now, that, this guy was probably terrified. I promise you, he didn't sleep a whole, night, a whole lot the night before because he, he knew he was going to get it from God and that 36 people were going to be really mad because I had cost them their loved ones. You get that. So it's just, it's just like tomorrow, we're going to show up. So they went home, they consecrated themselves, they searched their tents and said, I didn't accidentally take any of that. You ever been about to walk out of a, a store and you're like, let me see, did I put anything in my pocket? Because that little beeper is going to go off when you walk out the door. I'm terrible at Lowe's because it's like Lowe's. I'm sitting there and you know, you always use their tape measures. If you work at Lowe's, I forgive you, please forgive me. But you know, you've got to measure something and they got all those tape measures there and you, you're going to put it back. But instead of putting it back, you slip it on your, on your pocket I've just given you a whole lot of ideas. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to leave? You're going to home and get your tape measure and come back? No! Quit judging me. Anyway. <laughs> they're at home. They're searching their hearts. They show up the next day, and sure enough, God points that rascal out. All the tribes, all the family, they did what's called casting lots. I equate it to flipping a coin. All right, is it that one? Nope. Tails, you're out of here. Next. Oh, heads. Ah, we got the tribe. They narrowed it down to the tribe. They put all the families out. All right, let's, is it this family? Nope heads, he's good, tails. All of a sudden, it falls on you. Achan is his name. He was about to be Achan. Isn't there appropriate names in the Bible? And you know, Achan wasn't even a word there, but it is here because my legs are aching. <laughs> my bottom's aching from mama just... Okay, anyway, so Achan had effectively blocked. So here's the conversation that Achan had. Now listen very carefully. So Achan answered Joshua as after he was put out by God, and God will put you out. You know, everything done in darkness has brought the light, so you know that. You might as well just get and fess up. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. Now we're going to get the story. He said, I, When I saw among the spoils a beautiful mantle of Shinar. And you go, well, a beautiful mantle of Shinar means nothing to you, right? You're going, what? A robe? This guy, he saw a cloak? He did this. He compromised because of a cloak. Well, this wasn't just a cloak. You know, I was doing some research, 
And I went online, and Gucci has a $23,000 jacket. And some of you would recognize it. You ought to be ashamed. So I remember listening to these ladies talking. They're like, oh, do you see those shoes? She's $1,600 shoes. I'm going, one, you need to repent for even knowing that. <laughs> but this wasn't just a jacket. This was a Gucci. Well, what, what I mean by that, it was their day of a Gucci. It was a particular robe that was only made in one place on the entire face of the earth. One place was capable of producing something this significant. One place. To wear this, remember when fur jackets were the thing? This was the $24,000 fur jacket. It embodied prestige. It embodied pomp and circumstance. So don't roll your eyes. It wasn't just a leather jacket from, from somewhere that, from Walmart. This was a Gucci. And some of you, you understand. And 200 shekels of silver. He said, I saw 200 shekels. You know what that is? That's cash money. That's not only cash money, it's $20 bills. Now, what, what I mean is it's spendable. See, you, somebody, you find money laying beside the road and it's $100 bills, you might get busted with it. But it's $20. It's broken into spendable increments that can fit right into your bank account with no suspicion. Cash. Everybody knows what you can do with cash. Listen to this. And a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. No, 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 this is interesting. Listen to this. This wasn't just a bar of gold. When you look into the original language, it literally says it was a... I right, be careful. Never do this. You know, watch this, boys, right before somebody does something really done. Never do this, but it was a tongue. <laughs> Never stick your tongue out on camera. That's what I, uh, it was your tongue of gold. You say, well, what, what, what does that mean? <laughs> Here's the speculation. The robe was worn by the priest of the temple, the, uh, the temple of the idol that contained the contributions of silver, which was the cash, and the tongue was the, the idolatrous altar upon which the contributions were placed. He found an idol's tongue that was 50 shekels. Again, the speculation is all of this happened in an idol's temple. It's like our world. We got no business operating in this world. We got no, no business desiring the things that are of this world, and this, this plays out so beautifully. So I'm going to ask you, what's your price? For what are we willing to compromise both God's command and the flow of His blessing? Because that's a reality. Status. Stuff, sensuality. I was going to put square footage because it's status stuff and square footage really sounds cool. But, but, but stuff, and stat, stuff and square footage is kind of the same, so I went with sensuality. That's more appropriate. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Do you see something? See, because we look at, 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 at poor old Aiken, and it was pretty obvious for him, but what about us? At least he compromised for a Gucci. At least he compromised for cash money. Very often we compromise his command, our obedience, and forfeit his blessing for something much more meager, much meager. For sometimes it's just to feel good. How many understand that, that sin is pleasurable? Listen, be careful, Tony. If it wasn't enjoyable, you were doing it wrong. <laughs> I'm just saying. Problem is, it comes with a price tag. We've been enlightened to that reality. Sure, sin is pleasurable, but it's not worth the long-term compromise of the blessings of God in our lives. There's more at stake than that momentary pleasure while pursuing the momentary gratification that is brought by status. Who cares what you think? They don't like you anyway because you've got something they want because they're envious. Stuff, come on, guys. It's going to burn. How much do you get to take with you to eternity? Not even your fancy Gucci jacket. Well, they might dress you in it and they stick it in the ground, but somebody's going to dig you up and steal it later. <laughs> Sensuality, your appetites. Guys, what's the problem? For what price are we willing to compromise? I want to take a look at this story from the in inside out, and the book of James really breaks it down. Listen to this. It says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away 
by their own desires and enticed. Our own innate, inherent desires, our own appetites. Now, drag us away. But listen, this word dragged away is, is interesting. And let me show you what it does. Your appetites and your desires take you from a, a position of commitment and conviction, and they drag you forcibly to a place of compromise. They take you by your arm or a chain, and they pull you from a place of conviction to a place of compromise. And drag shows that it does it in opposition to what you want, but you're powerless to stop it. Now, now think about this. This is the fight. This is our struggle. Each person in this room is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and tempted or enticed. Then, after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to the action or sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Of course, like I say, sin is pleasurable for a season, but it yields something that none of us want. It yields death. So this has been the pattern that has robbed humanity since the garden. The enemy has used our own appetites to destroy our marriages, to destroy our families, to destroy our finances, and ultimately our own appetites to destroy our own futures. We allow our desires to run amok to our own detriment. Now I want you to remember for a minute, think back to that story and listen to what Achan said. When he caught and he confessed up, he said, I saw... I coveted, I took, and then it took him. Sin and compromise will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than what you think you can pay. Always does. Price tag being death. So what can we learn from this? We need to learn this. Our desires will ultimately determine our direction. So let me ask you a question. What are the greatest desires upon what have you set your affections right now? Don't answer out loud. Just think about this. What goals and ambitions are motivating you to action right now? The answer, if we're honest, is very, very telling. If you will be honest about that, answering that question. It'll show you what your focus is. It'll show you what your desires are. And it'll ultimately show you and give you the wisdom to see what your destiny will be. Our desires will, whether we like it or not, determine our direction. They will drag us. If you're chasing something in this world, you will never find the purpose and the meaning that God intended. Jesus said it this way. Seek first. Make your desires his and everything else I will take care of, but we flip that around in our broken desires and our broken state. Who will deliver us from this body See, this is the beauty. You can't change your desires. The only thing that can change you from the inside out is that portion of God himself, the Holy Spirit, sovereignly being placed on the inside of you. As you accept his reality by faith, he places a piece of him in you and changes the very core of your desires. All of a sudden, what you wanted before changes. Otherwise, guess what it is? It's just behavioral modification. God cares why we do everything that we do. James 4, 1 through 4, really breaks this concept open and offers some incredibly profound insight. Now, James is addressing a very self-centered group of folks. And he speaks as plainly to these folks in this particular section of Scripture than any writer in the Bible speaks anywhere. I'm going to jump right into this. James says this, what causes quarrels among you? Do they not come from your desires? Remember, your desires will determine your direction. It will determine your behavior. Do they not come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. Pastor Tony, I've never killed anybody, but you've resented the man who got the promotion when you didn't. See, in the Old Testament, you had to plunge a knife into their heart, but God is concerned with the soul. God is concerned with the motivations. You don't have to kill. You just have to want to. You just want to have to, you just envy and it opens the door. Remember, he got it. You forget that promotion comes from God and you, and you abdicate responsibility and set about trying to bring about your own ends. That is, again, motivated by that one thing that feeds both, of, both the discontentment and the envy. 
Listen to this. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. And you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. I'm going to make it happen. You tell me no, well, I'm going to find a way to work around you and get it. Ooh, you're in a dangerous place then. When you choose to intentionally usurp the order, remember where it says there is disorder and every evil thing. When you say, God, I'm going against your order of authority. I'm, ju- I'm just going to jump in line. I'm going to do this. You open the door for some bad stuff. At the most primal level, what most motivates us to anger? I mean, think about it. Why do people get, why do you get mad? Think about it. What, what, what really causes anger? Can I just be honest? You don't get your way. You don't get, we, I'm in this boat, I'm preaching from the middle. We don't get what we think we should get when we think we should get it. That makes me mad. And we throw a temper tantrum for which we would spank our children. Yet we give ourselves a pass. Or somebody doesn't do what you think they should do when you think they should do. I'm just being honest. So what is our response? We get mad because of the desires that battle within us. They're not just battling against people. Our our desires battle against God. What does that look like? I'll show you. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your own pleasures. First of all, we don't even ask God. We try to do it ourselves. And in hindsight, we may repent and go, you know what? Oh, yeah, by the way, God, I got this plan. Will you bless my mess? That's not the way it works. Hopefully, you're spiritual enough to realize that you've done it and come back and correct it. In a lot of cases, well, maybe you're not. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your own pleasure. Listen, God is not scared of, of money. He's scared of what you might do with it. See, if you want to destroy somebody, let them win a lottery. You want to destroy a fool, give them money. And they will go out and they will have a meth party. And they will kill somebody. And you will lose them forever because you thought you were doing something good. God is smart. Do you understand? But God understands. A man or a woman who can be trusted with money to spend it not on their pleasure, but on his promise and his mission, guess what? When God understands, see, Abraham was loaded. Solomon was loaded. Why? Because, see, God understands that a man or a woman who will be a conduit, not a, not a, uh, a dead sea of his generosity, is somebody that he can pour stuff into. The Proverbs puts it this way. There, there, there's one way of thinking that says, I get and I keep, and it comes to poverty. See, the world says, get, accumulate, and you'll be rich. No, no, God says there's another thought that says, I will give and be generous, and it leads to prosperity. See, when you bring God into the equation through faith, saying, you know what, I'm going to give because he, is, he has blessed me, and I want to bless other people. I want to use what he has given me to further his agenda, not accommodate my pleasure. Suddenly, God can give you something. Because he can trust you with it and it won't destroy you. He loves us. We know we don't give our kids credit cards. They'd spend all our money on the candy aisle at Family Dollar. (laughs) Anyway, all right. Next one, you adulterous people, he said. Now, this adulterous thing is interesting because anytime you think about your relationship with God, you must consider it in the context of covenant. We don't talk about that enough. I want you to understand covenant. The marriage is the most easily identifiable thing that we have in our culture with covenant. But he says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes hostile or is an enemy of the almighty God. The word adulterous there is interesting. It is literally, he sees you as his bride and he doesn't share. He doesn't want to share. He sees you as that one person that he he placed a portion of him in. James goes on to say that the Spirit of God, God lusts after the Spirit that he put on the inside of you. He took a piece of him. He put in it inside of you to transform you so that he wouldn't just get back that, but he got you back with it. Oh, he is jealous for us, not of us. That's messed up. He's jealous for us. He wants you after his spirit has accomplished what he put it in to do. And for you to, for us 
to run after something else. You say, well, Pastor Tony, what is it that we run after? It's the world. What is the world? Status, stuff, and sensuality. All the cheap substitutes that rob us from the generosity of God's flow. You adulterous people. I'm going to stop reading there. But James goes on to tell us that pride is the common root of envy and discontentment. What does that mean? It means that pride is not something, just something merely that we observe on the athletic field. Pride is the most egregious of all sins against God. Pride is placing me and mine in a place of preeminence. Pride places our wants above everything else, proving to be the most egregious of sins. James continues by outlining a path of restoration for those who have forsaken the favor of God. He offers repentance. He gives this, and then he goes into this, this thing of saying, guys, here's what you have to do. Here's your true state. Here's what's really going on in this messed up church that he's addressing. Now, here are seven steps that will free the flow. I'm not going to read those. Every one of these is taken directly from the scriptures that are found in chapter 4, verses 5 through 17. There is a comprehensive step-by-step -step list. I love lists. I do. I'm sorry. I think God loves lists because he gives a bunch of them all through the Bible. I'm not saying a formula, but lists and steps. God wants to give us every opportunity to walk back from him or back to him. All right, y'all ready for this? Anybody want the steps to free the flow in your life of God's generosity? Here they are. Number one, submit and commit everything to God. It's not just submitting everything. It's not just turning from something, it's turning to something. We've submitted ourselves and our, our ambitions and all of our members to the things that this world has said it is important, and God's going, rebel against that. Commit absolute surrender to me. Commit and submit. Number two, actively resist our natural impulses. Here's something that we need to just go ahead and understand. This requires effort. It requires intentionality. Selfishness is ever-present in every, every, every single one of us. That's what I'm saying, guys. I'm, I'm teaching this from the middle. Don't think I'm not as selfish at my core. I've just been living with this selfishness a lot longer in some cases. Actively resist our natural impulses just because it feels good. That doesn't make it, make it okay. And that's what this culture is teaching. This culture of, of paganism and, and deism and everything else says, if it feels good, do it. They don't tell you what the price tag is. Number three, actively inquire of God. This is the evidence of the God kind of faith. This is evidence of true faith. Pride says, and, 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 and I said this, how many times have we started to do something only to turn around and again think of God as an afterthought and say, oh, 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 yeah, actively in inquire of God. Why is this the evidence of true faith? Because if you believe that God is, which is the first prerequisite, and you believe that he is a rewarder, that means you're going to actively invite him into every area of your life. Something that God's been doing in me for a couple of months now is when I wake up and when I'm praying, when I'm connecting with God first thing in the morning, my heart says this, God, please give me the grace to not miss one opportunity to invite you into whatever circumstance I find myself in today. There's a reason. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But I, inviting God, actively inquire of God if he knows the truth, we need to hear it. Number four, abstain from sinful behavior. I must admit, I was going to say, stop it, and just put there, but I thought abstain from sinful behavior might give a little more context. Why do I say that? God's grace grants power over sin in our lives. Did you hear what I just said? You were not saved and filled with the Spirit of God to continue in the woefully selfish, broken habits that you were found in. God's grace was given to you that you might not continue in sin, but that you might continue free from sin. Hey, listen, listen, listen. Just because I have a sinful nature doesn't mean I'm obligated to sin. Well, Pastor Tony, all of us sin every single day. Listen, listen to me. Stop it. Let me, newsflash, no, you don't. 
Every single one of us walk every day with a violent opposition to what is good roaring on the inside of us. But never does God give us permission because of that because his grace is greater than any power that would keep you in the bondage of that behavior. My life, your lives are testaments of that. That God's grace is stronger than the habit that held you. God's grace. Grace is stronger than the chains that bind us. You have been called to freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from walking under the dictates of your flesh and the demands that you sin. Yes, there's a battle that rages. But God has promised if we will seek him, that he will give us the power to achieve ascendancy over every area of failure in our life. We were created to be more than conquerors. You know what that means? That means hope for this world. It doesn't obligate us to accept every sinful behavior that's in our lives. Number five, stop trying to date the world. Why? Because when you realize what you've been kissing on, as the corpse that it really is, it's going to be hard to get that taste out of your mouth. Do you understand? Stop dating the world. Stop dating and looking for meaning and status. It's an erroneous, adulterous relationship in what we have, in our stuff, in our status, in our sensuality. God calls us, but we want to, as Christians, as a church, just just smooch all over that thing that is dead. Stop trying to date the world. If you think you're going to be intimate with God and intimate with this broken mess at the same time, you are deceived. God's not, in, God's not a swinger. God's not going to share you with anybody. He is a jealous God. Rightfully so, because he's given us something incredible. He says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. You who have a divided soul. One thing God does not like is divided loyalty. You've heard it. If you don't stand for something, you fall for everything. That's not just a cool saying. That's a fact. If you do not totally commit, you will find yourself totally submitting to every desire that comes along and every temptation causes you and us to stumble. You can't have a girlfriend and a wife. Try that. (laughs) Let me know how that works for you. If it doesn't work here in this broken mess, you think it's going to work with a holy God of glory? Yeah, right. Plus, who can deal with two wives? All right, next. Humbly seek the presence of God. Listen, listen, you can call me what you want. You can leave out of here thinking what you want, but here's what I want. I I need, I crave, I desire more of the presence of God. Why? Because his presence is the difference maker. (sighs) If there's something that's going to be a a telltale sign of the lack of the power of the church. It is his presence. Guys, it doesn't matter what we do if we do it void his presence. You know what it is? It's nothing more than a gratification or appeasing of our personal desire to accomplish something. We need God in the midst of us. That's why at times during praise and worship, you, you might look over and I might have a funny look on my face because I understand that God inhabits the praises of his people and I crave his presence. And that's for one reason, because it is his presence and his power that has bought deliverance in every area of bondage that has been in my life. And I'm not saying I'm totally free from everything, but I can guarantee you this. When Christ reaches his end for my life, which I 100% am willing to submit to, he will present me to himself as a spotless bride. That's his desire for all of us. His presence is the difference maker. Amen? I don't want to clog the flow. I want all of him that I can get. I want God to be real to me. And last one, and this is a very practical one that he throws in the middle. If you want to unclog the the pipes, if you want to make sure that you don't kill the blessing, stop trashing people. This is a very obvious way to preserve unity and secure the continual flow of God's generosity. Why? Because people are your practice for his presence. What did what, 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 what you say, Pastor Tony? I said people are your practice for his presence. If you can't retain right relationship with people, if you're not aware of when you've hurt them or willing to get it right, do you think you're going to get it right with a God you can't see? 
Have you ever said something to somebody and when you were talking to them, something come out and it's like, oh, don't know if I should have said that. And you go home and you're thinking, wow, maybe I shouldn't have said that. One of two things are going to happen. You're going to come back and you're going to make sure that 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 plate is clean. Or you're going to let it fester. See, if you can keep it right with people who are made in the image of God, it's a real good indicator that you will be sensitive when the Holy Spirit says, Tony, don't do that. Don't make that decision. Don't go down that road. It's a dead end. I want you to think about this. I just want you to ask you this, just in this, this moment right here. We've, we've said all this to come to, to this point. We talk about allowing God's generosity to flow in our lives. Achan had taken some things and he had buried it among his own things. Do, do you have things in your tent? Are there things in your life that you absolutely know should not be there there's only one response we need to go to our tents and we need to dig up that thing that is cursing ourselves maybe it's a behavior maybe it's a relationship maybe it's a lack of sincerity or lack of commitment maybe you're not committed but many of us have have absolutely surrendered but I want to say this to you very very quickly God is a God of absolute surrender but sometimes we find ourselves picking up and carrying things that we shouldn't be carrying. We accumulate things from the victories and the failures and whatever, and and we we hide them in places. And and all of a sudden, Paul said it this way. He said, said, get rid of every weight and every sin that does so easily attach itself. There, There was, years ago, I used to take Kung Fu. I'm not validating this, but But one of the moves that they had and we learned, we would blindfold ourselves. And, and when you felt something grab you, you, sh- you shrugged it off. And we did it over and over to where it become a reflex. Guys, all through our lives, offenses and hurts and disappointments will try to attach themselves to you. And the enemy wants you to to give place to those so he can stop you from running hard toward the finish line, hard toward the destiny that he has for you. I'm, I'm just asking you not for absolute surrender, but for absolute surrender and continual surrender. Be quick to say, God, I know I buried something in my tent and I need to get rid of it because nothing is more important than your presence in my life. If you feel that way, stand with me and let's pray. I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to intercede kind of in a way, but there's going to be people up here to pray for you. If you need further prayer, please don't hesitate. Come up after service and and somebody can pray for you. But if you desire to walk under that open heaven, to be that presence of God in the earth like never before. I'm going to ask you, set yourself in agreement with me right now. Father, this earth and the fullness of it is yours. God, I'm asking you. God, anything that is hidden within our hearts, anything, any areas of compromise, anything that we have not surrendered. Father, if we've been dating and messing around with the world, I'm asking you first and foremost, Father, forgive us. God, we know that everything done in darkness is ultimately brought into the light. But Father God, we don't want to cause harm in anybody else's life. And we don't want to stop the flow of your generosity and kill your blessing in our life. So Father, I'm asking you by your grace to make our hearts clear to us. Give us the grace, Father, to lay everything down, to surrender everything to you. Father, grant us your presence in our lives like never before. In Jesus' name, amen.